So we're now in a position where we can talk about the probability that each of the energy levels of a rigid rotor is occupied. The ground state we might have expected would be most populated, but it turns out that's not quite true because if we look at that def, uh, uh, equation for the population of each one of these energy levels, it includes not just a Boltzmann factor for how high up the ladder the energy state is, but also a degeneracy. And the higher up this ladder we climb, the more degenerate, the, num the higher the number of states there are at that level. So if we look a little more closely at this equation, so we've got constants all over the place in this equation, but this depends on the quantum number. If I want to know the probability as a function of the quantum number, the L's show up in front of the exponential as just a linear term, an L, and then the exponential looks like e to the minus L squared. Actually, L squared plus L, but in a rough sense, it looks like L times e to the minus L squared. That function, if I were to graph what L times e to the minus L squared looks like, or in fact what this piece of L function looks like as a function of L, at small values of L, this number is small, so the function is small. At large values of L, e to the minus L squared has certainly become very small, so the function becomes very small at high values of L. And what we have is a function that starts out small when L equals 0, goes through a maximum, and comes back down. The key points about this are The degeneracy, this, this increase as I begin increasing the value of L, the probability of occupying the zeroth state when I go to the first state or the second state, those probabilities are increasing. And the reason they're increasing is because of the degeneracy. But then later on, so that happens at small values of L. At larger values of L, the function begins to decrease again. And that's Boltzmann telling us why that's true. The higher the value of L, the higher the energy of each energy level. The Boltzmann factor, either the full-blown Boltzmann factor or this little sketch of the Boltzmann factor, tells us that that Boltzmann factor becomes very small when L becomes very large. So for large values of L, the probability begins to decrease again. So there's some point. After increasing and then decreasing, the function goes through a maximum at some point. So there's some particular value of L where this function takes on its highest possible value. That's interesting because it says the ground state is not the most occupied energy level. The L equals 1 state might be more occupied because there's even though each one of these individual states has a higher energy and is less occupied than the ground state, there's three of them. So the whole level might be more populated than the ground state. So somewhere up this ladder, you get to a, a, an energy level, maybe the L equals 2 or maybe the L equals 3, that's most populated. And then the population starts to drop off as you continue to climb higher. So it's interesting to know what is that most populated rotational level? What can we expect a rotating diatomic molecule to do, How, whether it rotates with a little bit of energy in the L equals 2 level or a lot of energy in the L equals 5 level depends on the conditions. But we can uh, learn something about what that maximum uh, rotational level is or, or rotational level with the highest population. So the way we do that, of course, we're looking for the point on this graph that's the highest. We're looking for the point where the slope reaches 0. So since we have an equation for p sub l, we can take its derivative and set it equal to 0. So the derivative is equal to 0 when I'm at the most populated rotational level, l max. So let's go ahead and take the derivative of this expression with respect to l. The l's here show up both in the prefactor as well as in the exponent. So we're going to have to use chain rule. I'm sorry, not chain rule, product rule. So if I take the derivative of this L, I've got 1 over Q times 2. That's the derivative of this quantity 2L plus 1. And since I've taken the derivative of this one, I leave the exponential alone, e to the minus 
theta rotational over t, L times L plus 1. I need to add to that the derivative when I leave this L alone and take the derivative of the other ones. So leave the 2L plus 1 alone, take the derivative of this exponential. The derivative of an exponential is an exponential. multiplied by the derivative of the exponent. So I've got constants in front of some L's, so this derivative is going to look like minus theta rotational over t. That's this minus theta rotational over t. And the derivative of L times L plus 1, let's write this as L squared plus L. The derivative of L squared plus L is 2L plus 1. Notice that 2L plus 1 is the same as this 2L plus 1. I can, uh, on the next line, I'll write that as 2L plus 1 quantity squared. So this long, fairly ugly expression is the thing we want to set equal to 0. But luckily, a lot of things factor out. So I've got a 1 over Q in both terms. I've got the exponential in both terms. So let's go ahead and say 1 over q e to the minus theta over t L, L plus 1. Those are the terms that those two terms have in common. Those all multiply. All that's left over in the first term is a 2. All that's left over in the second term is a minus theta rotational over t. And a 2L plus 1 that shows up twice. So that whole thing, we need to be equal to 0. 1 over q is not going to be 0. This exponential is not going to be 0. Only thing that can be 0 is the quantity in brackets. So and the way to make that equal to 0 is if the 2 is equal to the theta rotational over t times 2L plus 1 quantity squared. So I need theta rotational over t times 2L plus 1 squared to be equal to 2. So I need to solve that expression. Remember what we're solving for. We're solving for the value of L that makes this function reach its max. So we're looking for this value of L at which the function reaches a maximum. So we just do some algebra to isolate this L. If I bring the t and the theta over to the right-hand side, I'll have a 2L plus 1 squared on the left side. If I take the square root to get rid of the square, I'll have this expression. I need to subtract 1 from both sides. So I've got, uh, on the left side, I've got square root of 2t over theta minus 1. That's equal to 2L. And if I divide by 2, the last version of this equation will be L is equal to if I divide by 2 inside the square root, it becomes a 4. So 2 divided by 4 puts a 2 in the denominator. And if I have a minus 1, when I divide that by 2, it becomes a minus 1 half. So I'll put that expression in a box, because it's one that we can reuse. That value of L, that's our L max. That's the value of L at which the derivative of the function is equal to 0. So that tells us the most populated rotational level. So we can work an example or two and see how that works. So with our favorite molecules, let's say we have carbon monoxide, which has a rotational temperature of 2.77 Kelvin. If we have carbon monoxide molecules at a room temperature 298 Kelvin, then the most populated rotational level, according to this expression we've just derived. Square root of temperature over twice the rotational temperature minus a half. So plug those numbers into our calculator. 298 Kelvin divided by about 5.5 Kelvin. Take the square root of that number, subtract a half, and we find that it's equal to 6.8. All right. That's a little strange. What does that mean? We've solved for the most populated rotational level. 
The rotational level is an integer. That's a quantum number. It has to be L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2, L equals 3. L equals, where's L equals 6.8? That's between 6 and 7, so that's impossible. There's no molecules that occupy the 6.8th rotational level. All that means is only 0 or 1 or 2, only integer values of this function uh, are acceptable. So somewhere, so 6.8 is the max, which is somewhere between the, the 6 value and the 7 value. So the way to interpret this result is to say maybe the 6th or maybe the 7th value is the most populated. This one is closer to the L equals 7th level. So if we wanted to be extra careful, we could evaluate the, the L equals 6 and the L equals 7 and see which one has a higher population using this expression. Or we can round off to 7 and say the most populated rotational level is going to be the L equals 7 level. So not 0 or 1 or 2 or 3, but remember, because carbon monoxide behaved fairly classically, somewhere way up uh, multiple levels higher at the L equals 7 level is going to be the most populated one. On the other hand, if we take a molecule like HCl, which has a rotational constant of 15.4 Kelvin. Earlier, when we asked some questions about that molecule at 77, that uh, experimental temperature of 77 Kelvin, and decided it behaved somewhat quantum mechanically, its most populated rotational level, square root of temperature over twice the rotational temperature, minus a half. Calculator tells us that that result comes out to be 1.08, which again, to round off to an integer, rounds off to 1. So for HCl, we decided that was a fairly quantum mechanical molecule because only about a handful of, of states are occupied. The most populated state is this L equals 1 state. There's more molecules in this L equals 1 energy level than there are in the ground state, but there's also more molecules here than there are up here. So already the population has begun to fall off as we climb beyond L equals 1. So this expression is, is fairly useful. It tells us something about the tension between the degeneracy that causes the states to be more occupied as I climb the ladder and the Boltzmann energy, which causes them to be less occupied as I climb the ladder. And somewhere in the middle, there's a maximum, and we can now calculate what that maximum is.